Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Baer, and we have guest William Von Holst with us. Now we're going to be discussing the way of the spiritual warrior, timeless path to enlightenment. This is by Emery Vallion, and let me just give you a quick excerpt of the book. This is a very special book, a must-have resource full of inspiration and techniques for all those aspiring to be true spiritual warriors. The art of the warrior is to be enlightened every second of every day. It is not something you look forward to in the future. It is something you live now. The warrior path is always in the immediate moment, at this second of time, in your total relationship with the outer world and the world inside you. With the divine presence within you and the divine presence outside you, the way of the spiritual warrior starts with self-knowledge, learning to harmonize your personality. The next stage is using meditation and other spiritual techniques to withdraw your awareness slowly inside you until you make a connection with yourself as a living soul and recognize that you are an immortal spiritual being. All right, this is great. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. How the heck are you, William? I'm doing great. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. I'm glad to have you on the show. Now, please tell us about the book and what is the path of a spiritual warrior? What this book is focusing on is that everyone on the spiritual path has struggles. Everyone has challenges with the world. Everyone has challenges within. And so what Emery focused on, he's always very, very practical. For him, spirituality is not something nebulous, something of faith, something that is kind of airy-fairy. For what for Emory, spirituality is a science, and I mean that in a very good sense, because what that means is that if you do certain things, if you understand certain things, you will have certain results. So Emory is always very specific and very practical. So what he says is that we who live on this planet, who live in this school of hard knocks, it's a tough place to be, it's a tough place to incarnate. As we all know, what's happening in the world, what's happening in America, things are getting, getting tougher, things are getting more crazy. So what Emory is focusing on is that, yes, the outside world is going crazy, but we don't need to be impacted by that craziness. What we can do is that we can become truly connected within. And when you're truly connected within, then, as he says, what you become is that spiritual warrior. So you become a focus of light. You become a focus of stability you become a focus of, of calmness. So in all this chaotic world that we're all experiencing, and, and many people are getting hit either emotionally or getting hit mentally or getting hit physically by all different kinds of predicaments, what Emory is teaching is that for more and more people to be really clear within, to be really, really connected with their inner soul or connected to the light itself or connected to their true being within, that they become of service, they can help many, many other people and they become like, as Emery said, you know, Christ was a spiritual warrior. The Buddha was a spiritual warrior. Kuan Yin was a spiritual warrior. Oddly enough, the, the mother of Christ, the Virgin Mary herself, was, was a very powerful spiritual warrior. So these are um, examples of, of these very powerful spiritual leaders in the past who have been a, a, a beacon of light or a beacon of hope or a beacon of light that has helped certain civilizations through certain crises. Now, what is a way to actually get to that stability and be able to be, I guess you could say, like water? What, what I'm, and this is why I've been working with Emory for 30 years, so I, I've been working exclusively with Emory, so I, I really understand what the process that he teaches. And, and in the very first few chapters, what he talks about is that we as a personality, and he uses this metaphor, we're like a vehicle, and we have four wheels. And we, the four wheels are the physical body, which we all know, we all have an etheric body, which is our vitality body, kind of the body that gives us life and, and energy. Some people, like an athlete, has a very, very strong vital, um, vital body or etheric body. Um, someone who is sick or, or struggling has a very weak etheric body. So that's another wheel on this vehicle. And there's two other wheels on this vehicle. There's the emotional body, uh, your feminine astral, all your emotions, every time you dream, you're in your emotional body, and then there's also a mental body, and that's another wheel. So what he, what he suggests in the beginning on the path is that you really become balanced so that all of your four wheels are on the earth, are driving, are, you know, if you have a car, you know what it means to have your axles and everything all balanced. So what he says is the first step is that you balance 
or that you have a well-balanced four wheels on your vehicle. And for a lot of people, that's not the case. For a lot of people, they may be too emotional, they may be too mental, they may be too focused on the physical plane, on their body. So they're not driving with those four tires on the road. They're kind of driving with perhaps two tires on the road and two tires up in the air. So it's hard to them for that vehicle to actually drive on the road. And the other part of this whole metaphor is that the true driver of a well-balanced vehicle is your soul itself. So when your four wheels are balanced, then your soul can actually grab that steering wheel and then drive that vehicle of the personality. And the soul then has this vision of where it wants to drive and not be so much the the victim of of a, a personality out of control trying to drive this vehicle every which way with four tires not on the road, maybe one or two or whatever, tires connecting the road and other tires up in the air. So this metaphor of a vehicle, four wheels firmly on the earth, and then the soul is able to drive and be well grounded. And that's really the the first step of the spiritual warrior. That's incredible. It almost reminds me of the old shamans, how they would create balance with the mind, body, and soul. They had different wills that they used, etc. And meditation is so powerful. It can be such a great cornerstone if you can actually learn to silence the mind for a period of time. For more than 10 seconds, I would recommend anybody listening to this broadcast, try to actually silence your mind for 10 seconds and think about absolutely nothing. It's, it's a lot tougher than it sounds if you've never tried it before. So does he teach are some different techniques uh, taught within this book, William? There, there's, um, there's many, many techniques. And to go back to what you just said, the, the silencing of the mind is, is well, it's actually the silencing of the mental body. I was also silencing the emotional body because you can, you can sit down and try to be quiet your mind might be still, but your emotions can get can pour in. You get anxious, or you, you have an itch, or you're worried about paying your taxes tomorrow. So it's it's it's. I mean, the whole the spiritual path is learning how to be in control of your your bodies. And silencing the mind is a tough one. It's a real. I mean, people for thousands of years struggle how to silence the mind, and it's challenging just to sit down to try to silence it, because it's it's the mind trying to silence itself which is very challenging. What Emery says, if you want something to happen, you have to bring in a higher energy and let that higher energy or that higher technique or higher process silence the mind. Because if you try to silence the mind with your own mind, it's like you're just struggling, you know, between a rock and a hard place is one way of saying it. So in this book, he gives many techniques. He gives two breathing techniques. He also gives some techniques of uh, intoning mantras uh, if I remember correctly, there's also um, in techniques of intoning vowels. So what this means is that you do a, a technique and your mind focuses on that technique, focuses on the breath meditation, focuses on a mantra, focuses on a task. So what that does is it keeps the mind busy. It's like the analogy is we all have kind of a monkey mind. The, the monkey loves to jump from branch to branch to branch. So you, if you try to still that monkey, it's really hard. But if you keep the monkey busy, meaning that the monkey, the mind, is focusing on breathing in, breathing out with particular words or mantras, then the monkey's kind of happy. It doesn't jump all over the place. And then when the monkey kind of gets focused on the task, then what happens is that there's another quality that, that is allowed to manifest, and your mind actually becomes quiet, or your emotions actually become, become quiet. So it's an it's a interesting way of, of, and a very practical way, of dealing with the challenges of what it's like to be human, to be on this planet in the 21st century, to be affected by all these crazy energies that are going on everywhere. And as Emery said, these crazy energies are only going to increase because of many, many different factors. So we need help. We need ways to, to deal with all this chaos. Absolutely. Now, are there certain foods and like times of day that he recommends eating? Does, does he recommend staying away from different meats and stuff like that as well? Or Well, this is a personal note, but he, he grew up in Hungary during World War II in Budapest and uh, quite poor. And this is a little side story, but I was living with him down in San Diego and uh, we were making bacon in the morning. And, you know, for me, I, you know, the bacon grease is all kind of put in a jar and just forgotten about and thrown away someday. He was very adamant that I don't throw out the bacon grease. So, of course, I didn't. It stayed in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Then for lunch, a few weeks later, he takes out this jar of bacon grease, takes a huge knife, slaps it all over a piece of bread, puts paprika on it, and tells me this is 
what he grew up with, and he called it a fat sandwich. So for Emery, I know lots of people focus on all kinds of diets and has something to do with spirituality. For Emery, that's, that's just, uh, it's not that important. What's really important is that you, you bring in higher energies. And when you bring in those higher energies, whatever you do in the physical plane is, is, doesn't have that all importance. It's what you're bringing in light. You're bringing in a vibration of a higher frequency and that, fr- that light itself, which is intelligence, or that higher frequency, which is also intelligence, that does the, does the work. And what you eat is not so important. Hours of the day, not so important. You know, all the kind of people get very distracted with all kinds of things like that. Okay, so that's really not the main focus. It's more so uh, just being in tune and balance. Now, is there a certain amount of meditation each day that Emery recommends in the way of the spiritual warrior? Well, he's he's a teacher, so he he recommends you know meditation in the morning, of course. Or actually, what he recommends is that that we are self responsible, meaning that each person and every person is very very different. But he says that each, each person needs to understand their life or understand their life ways. And then in that responsibility, you know what works best for you. You know what, what times of day or what techniques or however your life is manifesting that you yourself are in charge of, of your spiritual path or you becoming that spiritual warrior. And it, it's, um, I mean, he gives the basis. I mean, the book is a beautiful instructions of, of what the path is about, very practical techniques, the crisis of the world. And what he also says that, that we are self-responsible, meaning that, that since everyone is so, so differently wired or, or different karmas, we all come from very, very different backgrounds. Of course, what Emery teaches and all great teachers um, adhere to the idea that we have Incarnated lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So, in fact, in the early Christian Christianity, for the first couple hundred years, that that idea of reincarnation was very much part of the Christian teaching. Uh, it got knocked out for religious reasons or, or political reasons, I should say. But so, what that means is that everyone has different backgrounds. Everyone has a different energy within. Some people are more Eastern. Some people are more Western. Some people have had different um, processes. So, those are all still that memory is still still within you. It's actually within your astral body and your mental body. So you are responsible for, for connecting to that and knowing what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, have you practiced these teachings that are in this book? Have you gone through a lot of this stuff also? Yes, yes. What has it done for you personally? What it's done for me is that it is, for the most part, and this is another part of Emery's teaching, which I really love. It's, what he's saying is that we're not meant to be perfect. And what that means is that when you incarnate, you can only incarnate because of imperfections. If you were perfect already, you could not incarnate. So even a person like a Christ or a Buddha or a Kuan Yin, we're not perfect. So because we, to, to come down into this physical plane, which is very, very far from perfection, you have to be imperfect in your, in your nature. So what Emery focuses on is that you're not trying to be perfect. What you're trying to do is to be balanced. So for me, over these last 30 years, what I've been able to, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, that's not anything that, that is important, but to help other people is that I've learned that no matter what is happening around me, that I have a source of strength within that I can always hold on to. And it's not like I'm trying to, to, to change what's happening around me because what's happening around me just it just happens, but that my response to what is happening around me is coming from a calm, clear understanding instead of someone who's getting thrown off or emotionally off balance or mentally off balanced or physically off balance. And it doesn't always happen. Sometimes, of course, I, I do get thrown and I realize that I've gotten thrown and then you know, I come back into myself and, and work it through. Now, having an out-of-body experience is pretty incredible, and I've talked to others on this show before with The Week Project that say they've actually made contact with entities outside of their body. Um, have you or Emery ever had those types of experiences? Well, of course, and, and, but as I said before, for Emery, it's a science. So what that means is, is that when you leave your physical body, which you do when you dream, 
So you actually, when you dream, you step out of your physical body and you move into your astral body. So as you know, we probably all dream, we know our dreams. Sometimes dreams are very crazy. Sometimes they're very clear. Sometimes they're very mucky. Sometimes they're, they're hellish, you know, running from someone or, or destruction. A lot of people have mentioned over the years, just enormous destruction happening on the astral plane. What that is, is that you are experiencing that world through your astral body. And that's also when you die, you, you step out of your physical body, you move through your third body, and then you step into the astral body. So you are living a life in your astral body. And basically, if, if, if you haven't caused too much trouble in life, you, you are in a nicer place. If you cause a lot of harm in your life, you're not, you're not in such a great place. But what that means is that you can have, you can have spiritual understanding out of your body so if you are meditating or something happens all of a sudden you're thrown into another world what emory suggests is that if you understand because there's not just one world you can get thrown into there's multiple worlds that you can be thrown into there's actually seven levels in the astral plane itself there's seven levels it's called the mental plane or the the heavenly worlds there's seven levels there you can actually get thrown into your soul and experience your soul at the soul level so what Emory teaches is that when you are out of the body, that you have a clear enough understanding within to know where you are and to know, because each of these different worlds, very different uh, characteristics, very different vibrations, very different. Uh, it's not like the physical plane. If you're thrown into your, if you experience your soul at the soul level, it's eternal. There is no space or time. So it's a completely different reality than living here on the physical plane. So what Emory always emphasizes is that if you have a clear understanding of, of the possible worlds that you can get thrown into, that you understand it, and that you have a clear idea of where you've been when you come back into your physical body and know that, oh, you know, there's, there's other possibilities if you go even deeper. But for Emory, and of course, out of body experience is important, but for Emory, what the real task is, and this is what a spiritual warrior is about, is that you are able to stay in your physical body and you can have those inner experiences simultaneously. And what I mean by that is that and this takes a period of time, but that you, you are able to, to access, to experience those inner dimensions. You can even experience the, the level of your soul, but you're still in your physical body. So when that happens, then, as he says in the book, you become a, really a true spiritual warrior because then you are bringing these incredible dimensions, these incredible worlds right down here into the physical plane. What, what is so beautiful, and, and all the great teachers have talked about this, Christ has and Buddha has, is what they, they emphasize over and over and over again, is that you're, you are, every single person on this planet is an absolutely, exquisitely beautiful soul, a soul that is intelligent and, and incredibly wise, incredibly loving, uh, inc incredible beauty. So to, even though people get distracted or get off track here on the physical plane and cause harm to others or do all the crazy things that people have been doing, still within that, that, that person who's, who's misinformed at that time, there's an exquisitely beautiful soul. And of course, that, that person, when, when that person dies, has to deal with, with all the implications of what they've done in that life. But down the road, and it could be thousands or even, as Emery says, millions of years, that, that soul itself will eventually shine in a physical body and be this radiant, beautiful being. Now, the soul itself is just so incredible, the possibilities. I've talked to some people that have actually channeled those on the other side, and they explain what it's like as this just pulse of energy constantly. And I've often wondered, when our spirit does leave the body, you know, and we are reincarnated possibly, why? You know, why do we go into certain bodies at certain times? Are there these particular lessons that we need to learn for a higher evolution of our spirit? And is that kind of stuff discussed in the book? Oh, of, of course it does, and and the, and those are very profound questions. And uh, what and it basically, I'll try to do it justice because uh, it gets. I don't want to get too metaphysical, but what it is is that we we live in the divine consciousness, meaning that things are just not haphazard. Things are not, you know, science claims that we kind of came from monkeys and things kind of happen in some kind of funny way that science is still trying to figure out. That's not really true. What's really true is that there's a divine mind, and the divine mind has a divine plan. And that divine plan is that more and more conscious entities 
experience itself or experience the magnificence of the divine itself. So what that means is that we have been given souls and we have been given the, the journey or the responsibility to incarnate all the way down into the physical plane. So what that means is that even though we're divine, we are essentially thrown into an animal body. These bodies that we get thrown into do not come from the divine inner worlds. It actually comes from the animal kingdom. So what that does is that it makes a human being quite a, uh, a paradox, quite a kind of a catch-22, meaning that every single human being is partly divine and partly animal. But what that, what that means is, is that what our task is, or the divine plan is, is that we and our task, our soul, its task is to become that, that animal body becomes divine, or that, that animal body, that human being is able to bring in the divine, radiate that, that incredible energy, and help others. And the whole process is, is that this planet eventually will become a planet of light meaning that in the divine mind, it sees little old earth, that even though today it's a planet of darkness, and at the moment it's really dark because a whole lot of violence, a whole lot of horrible things are happening on this planet, and it's just part of a, you know, the school of hard knocks, just what we're going through at the moment. But someday, there will be enough human beings that are able to bring that divine energy into themselves, radiate that energy, and help transform this earth from, from a planet of darkness into a planet of light. You know, I mean, certainly I've heard the theory before of this earth is a very dense reality. And the other levels that people go to when they pass is oftentimes based on the karma here and their deeds for the, you know, I guess, future life essence, essentially. So I don't know. I mean, it does make sense when you think about some of the quantum physics theories and how we're all connected at some level, yet we're also individuals, but that primordial level, we're connected at some point. So I wonder with these different levels that you talk about, the seven levels that you can bring in new, uh, you know, energy sources and information, how, how many different levels have you personally experienced? I've had, um, I've had multiple experiences at multiple levels and they're, they're worlds that are impossible to describe in, world, in words. They're, they're very, very different than this physical plane. And what happens is that the further that you go in, the worlds, the dimensions, the energy becomes more and more challenging to describe in words because there's no English words for it. So even on, even on the astral plane, I mean, sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to describe a dream to somebody else. Or sometimes it's even difficult when you wake up and, and you're kind of struggling with a memory of what was going on and you can remember certain things but not other things. So a simple example, we have seven colors here on the physical plane, seven basic colors that, that are part of the, the, the spectrum. On the astral plane, there's actually 12 colors. So, and that's just a, a little metaphor. But as you go further and further, as you, if you experience your soul, the soul level, it's, it's, it's eternity. So there, you, even though you may have been there only for a few seconds, if you felt like you've been there for a thousand years, and that's not something you experience here on the physical plane. It's something that you experience at the level of your soul. So the, uh, the, the whole process is that it, the, the further they can go within, the stronger that you become here in your body on the physical plane and you become of service to others. So even though there's, what, 7 billion people running around the planet, Emery says that there's actually 3 billion who are on the inner levels waiting to come back. So... Emery says there are 10 billion in the human family. And when we're in this physical body, it all feels very, very, very separated. It all feels everyone's individual. They're all running around doing crazy stuff. They're all focused on themselves or, you know, that we're not interconnected. But the deeper that you go within what you experience, and this, the soul is really the first step, is that you, you experience more and more unity. So essentially, the human family, the 10 billion souls are one. It is a single consciousness. So as you go further and further within, you experience more and more of that incredible unified consciousness of the whole human family. As Christ said, if something happens um, to my brother, it happens to me. What that means is that when someone is, is hurt in front of you, you are hurt, meaning that we're all interconnected, meaning that we all, even though we may feel separated here in our bodies, in our minds and our emotions, on the inner levels, 
we we are a single family, a single consciousness, and we have a single task. So when we become more when when you become more and more connected to that, you realize we're we are a family. And of course we all in our own personal little families, if something happens to a brother or a sister or a mother or a father, it, it deeply affects you. And that's true on the inner levels for someone who's more and more connected within, is that anything that happens on the planet really deeply affects you because you are connected to everyone. Oh, that's great. Now, Emery Valion, that is just a really cool name, isn't it? I mean, wow. <laughs> that's like a movie star name. And he's also put together some other works as well, right? Oh, he's he's written a huge 2,000-page, um, four-volume set called The Heavens and Hells of the Mind. And it's, it's just an incredible uh, a whole history of, of spiritual traditions, a whole history of incredible techniques, and you know, a book that could take a decade to get through because it's so dense. And but there's other books as well. There's there's books he's written three books that this was a few years back talking about the crisis on the planet, the uh, horrible kind of uh, Armageddon-like things that are that are possible that even though it was written in 2009, 2010, it, it feels like as we go further in the future, it feels like those things are becoming more and more present. Meaning that what's happening on the planet is that there's a huge collision of energy, that there's, a, there's actually a downpour of light that's coming from the inner levels, which is adding a lot of stress to us here on the physical plane. So what that means is that for some people, they are really able to utilize that, that downpour of light and really become conscious or really kind of wake up and like connect to things. But for other people, what this means is that they're not able to handle the energy, that this pressure is getting so, so intense and they are, for whatever reason, it's too much for them. So unfortunately, we've had a whole lot of young men who have gone through incredible violence and have taken many, many lives with them it's they are unfortunately that that energy is, is has been too much for them and they haven't been able to to hold it very well and then they act out in these crazy ways now heavens and hells of the mind that sounds like just fascinating material i know that you said we could go on forever about that specific book because it's so dense but maybe if you could give us a condensed version about it or uh, a good description on what the basic synopsis is of it well, I, I can begin in the beginning with that book. And what, what he does is that he, he gives in long chapters on each of the dimensions that are within you. So he focuses on, on the physical dimension. Then, he, then there's a long chapter on what it means to be in your etheric body. And as I said, it's a science for Emory. So what that means is that like if someone dies and there's re they're really attached to the earth or they're really attached to their home or they're really attached to making money or relationships with other people, what happens is that they, they, of course, they're out of their physical body, but they're actually living in their etheric body. So what that means is that it's technically a ghost, because a ghost is someone who, who is kind of here in the physical plane, but kind of not here. But what that means is that essentially someone who, is, who has not made the proper transition from their etheric body into their astral body. Because once they move out of their etheric body, then they're in their astral body, and they're no longer here on the physical plane. So there are ghosts. There are people very attached to the physical plane. They die but they don't go through the, the levels of death. For Emory, what he says is that there's three or four levels of death that each of us go through, and what it means is that you eliminate the body that you're presently existing in. So you've died in your physical body, you move into your etheric body, you eventually die in your etheric body, you move into your astral body. You, most people can spend any number of years, even thousands of years in their astral body, and essentially there's a process of dying and going into the heavenly worlds. So what the book does in the beginning is that it describes very clearly these, these different worlds and what their qualities are, what their vibration is. So he goes in, of course, after that physical etheric world, he goes into the astral world. Then he describes the, uh, referred to as the mental plane or the higher heavenly worlds. And then he goes into the causal dimension. The causal is the level of your soul and very much focuses on the qualities of that world. And after that, there's the buddhic plane. And after that is the nirvanic plane, and there's par paranirvanic planes. And he, of course, for Emery, he's experienced each of these worlds ex incredibly. He knows these worlds inside out. And so he's able to describe from very real experiences what these worlds are like. So if you do have some experience, perhaps out of body or perhaps still in your body, you can actually go to this book and look it up 
and you get a very clear idea, oh yes, I was in my causal body, I experienced my soul, or yes, I was in the nirvanic plane and it was a sheer field of light itself, or I was in the buddhic plane, which is referred to as the world of unity. So it's, it's, a, it's an incredible tool that can help your, your, anyone's experience of what they've had and to know how it relates to, to everything else. Yeah, now also being able to get to that level, I've heard of people that can use, they can kind of activate their chakras and like the kundalini, they're able to activate that. I've heard multiple definitions on what it is. Does he talk about that at all? Or what do you know about the kundalini and the chakra system? Well, that's, those are two very different subjects and I'll focus on kundalini first. <laughs> well, no, well, you're asking good questions, but um, Emery's, what he, when he teaches, he, he, he's very thorough and will, will spend a long time on a single subject just so it's really clear. So kundalini is that fire that's within your base chakra. Now, that, that fire can, can be incredibly powerful and otherworldly kind of power. So if that's awakened, it's like it's awakening of the, the serpent or awakening of the snake, that if you're not prepared within, that can have have incredible destructive energies for anyone. So for Emery, he, he, we don't focus on awakening the Kundalini. What we focus on is that we prepare ourselves so we are well balanced. So the wheels, as I said in the beginning of the interview, those four wheels are well balanced on, on the earth. And what we do, instead of awakening the Kundalini, what we do is we bring energy from above down. And for Emery, it's a much safer way of working with the spiritual energies of working because these energies are very very powerful um if we to w w woke up some energy it could shatter us in a second so and fortunately we have protective there are walls between the physical plane the astral plane and the mental plane very thick walls so you just kind of can't like go running around and mixing up energies but for emery what what the best way is is to to work slowly not to rush and to work by bringing energy down into your being. And if, if Kundalini awakes, then you are strong enough within to be able to hold that energy. And then getting back to the other question that you're asking about the chakras, the shock, there are, of course, we all know there's seven chakras in the body, base, sexual energy, solar plexus, the heart, uh, throat, third eye, and crown. Those are seven of the, the lower chakras. Uh, each chakra has a a vitality, an energy, a purpose, a quality. And we also have three chakras above the crown. Our soul chakra is 18 inches above the crown of our head. There's also the Buddhic chakra, which is above that. And there's a Nirvanic chakra, which is even above that. For most people, those are, they're not able to go, for most people, they're not even able to go up to the crown chakra. For many people, we all, as personalities, exist in the lower three chakras. We have the base chakra, which is your fight or flight chakra. You have your sexual energy or your emotional energy. And you also have your solar plexus, which is your ego. So for most people, they really vibrate in those lower three chakras, which is fine. That's you, To be on this planet, you have to be in those chakras uh, to, to have a job, to have relationships, to, to do all the things that we do on the physical plane. Those energies need to be activated. So for Emory, the first major step is really lifting those energies. You can lift them up to the heart. The heart is this beautiful uh, field of unity. You can actually experience an incredible consciousness of, of unity when your heart is really open. You can move your energy up to your throat. Your throat is that creative energy. It's the energy from the sexual center lifted up to creativity. So any great artist has, has lifted up that sexual vitality and is radiating from, from their throat. You can lift the energy up to your third eye, that kind of mystical way of looking in the inner levels in the third eye. And you can even lift it up lift it up to the crown. The crown is like the opening to the, to the worlds above. So as I said before, the, those, when those four wheels are on the earth and the, the vehicle is solid, then those chakras are more interconnected. And when those chakras are balanced, then you become very receptive to these higher energies, which can pour down from above. Now, also, I've seen pictures of people that I have really cool auras with curly and photography and you can see different colors emanating when they'll hold certain relics, sometimes crystals. And I've seen these like biocosmic energy sensors and other things, nuclear receptors that they put on and it amplifies, at least with these curly and cameras, you can see the colors enhance. It's incredible. Yet I'm wondering, is that just a 
spin on light, or it's, it's got to be picking something up that we're not seeing with our eyes, because we only see about 0.01% of the electromagnetic light spectrum anyway, right? We, we perceive very little with our physical eye, it's true. But in terms of, to answer your question about your, your aura, your aura is filled with incredible energies, incredible vitalities, incredible possibilities. So everyone's aura, and it changes constantly from moment to moment, your aura is full of colors. Your aura is full of vibrations. And the vibrations can be, uh, if you're angry, you're, you're vibrating red hooks. If you're depressed, you're vibrating a, kind of a dark, mucky brown. Uh, if, you, if you are really coming from an open heart and Christ-like, you're, you're radiating a, a beautiful, soft pink. So what, what that means is that we all, we all kind of vibrate with just this incredible dynamic, multidimensional energies. And th it's beautiful, but what it also means is that, and this is kind of tricky, and I teach many classes, and I always try to, to help people understand this. And what I say is that we essentially, we're living in a tank. And what that means is that the, all these vibrations, and it's not just the colors, but there's the mental vibrations. So we're actually surrounded in our mental body. So even though our, our kind of brain is like the, the, the center uh, receiver of all that, there's a whole energy field around everyone that's this mental vibration, very, very strong mental vibration. So what this means is that because these, these, this aura is so full of itself or so full of vibrations, it's like you are in a cocoon of a tank, a very solid iron tank, which means that you're unable to experience the divine realities which are all around you meaning that we live in, in the divine itself. Here on the physical plane, you can experience the d divine itself because it's immediately present, but because we're so engulfed in ourselves, or so engulfed in the tank, that we're not able to perceive this divine presence because we're enclosed in the stuff of our own aura. So what Emory teaches is, and this is the tricky bit, is that you can't will away the stuff in your aura. You can't will away these colors. You can't will away these vibrations because that's just the mental plane kind of playing with itself. What you do is you invoke a higher energy and that higher energy comes into that tank and balances or smooths or dissolves some of the, the density or that lower vibration. So what you are doing is that you're actually lifting your vibration or lifting your frequency. When your frequency changes, when it, when it vibrates higher, then you automatically perceive that world that you're actually vibrating at. So if you can, if you can, and that's part of that whole process that I said in the beginning of, that, of those four tires. When those four tires, four wheels are well balanced, then you're in that process of this, this kind of mystical transformation so that you become more and more perceptive to, to the beauty, to the divine itself, which is right here. And if you look out in the air, the divine is present. It's right there. You know, between you and the, the sofa, between you and the television, or between you and, and the refrigerator, the divine, is, the divine is everywhere. You're able to perceive it and experience it. And for a warrior, what that means is that you, you experience the divine every second of your life, and you're, and you're constantly in, in, in consciousness with that divine, and you work from the divine's intention and not from your own selfish intention. With that said, if somebody wanted to really just maybe dedicate 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day into focusing on being a spiritual warrior. If you were to give them just a few steps within that time frame, what would be the most important thing in your opinion to give them for advice? And I have to say this over and over again because every single person is completely different. So what I could say is that if, if you are able to walk down a street or walk in the forest, or what, whatever that activity that you're doing, if you're able to focus on what you're experiencing and not focus on what you're thinking about. So what I'm saying is that we all have this, this we can all do it. It's just a matter, it's a very simple task. So you're not, because usually our mind is just going a mile a minute. We're walking down the street, and we're, you know, we're going, and we're not experiencing the world itself. So if you're able, even 10 minutes walking to work, just be, just be aware of yourself walking and observe what's around you. Observe the children in the street. Observe the, the business of the cars going by. Listen to the cars going by. 
don't get involved about, oh, I hate the traffic or I'm late for work. Or, or if you do, just recognize it and then go back to experience the world as it is. That's a very powerful technique because what you're doing is you begin to utilize something deeper within than just you mentally commenting to yourself about what you're experiencing. When we have dreams sometimes and we wake up and we're like, wow, that felt so real. Some people that have read many of the ancient mysteries and texts that have been hidden for thousands of years and kind of like the Nag Hammadi treaties as an example that was recently rediscovered in the mid-1900s or maybe early 1900s, but not a lot of people had access to it until now. There's a lot of different interpretations about spirituality, the archons, the creation of man in this form of this vessel, etc. And I, I often wonder, when people do things here on Earth, how much of an effect does it ha have in the afterlife for that person? Oh, it's a, it's a great question because it's, um, it's not what you think. And this is what I, I love so much about Emery. What Emery says is that if you are walking after a rain shower, especially I grew up in Chicago, so I know this very, very much an experience. And on the... All right, you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Okay, that's odd. My internet was showing it was fine. It was showing that you were online, and I don't know. Must be those Skype gremlins. Oh, I know. They're, they're a little nasty sometimes. <laughs> they sure are, man. So we were talking about kind of karma at on the other side. And you said it's not what you think it is, and then we got disconnected. Okay. What what that means is that, and this is, I, I find this so beautiful about Emory's teaching, is that the smallest act of kindness has an incredible impact on the divine mind. So when it rains out, there's worms on the sidewalk, they're they're suffocating because of, too much water in the grass, um, but they'll die on the cement. You reach down, you pick up a little worm, and you put it back in the grass. The, the divine consciousness registers that. So the, the divine is incredibly, it knows everything. So when you die, you may think you've done great things because you've been a president of the United States, or you've been a CEO of some huge company, or made tons of money. The divine mind's not all that concerned about that, but the divine mind has registered your acts of love, your acts of, of um, helping others, your, your acts of self-sacrifice. I've often wondered that I myself, if I see a, a little insect running across the you know sidewalk or something like that, or about ready to get fried or something, I'll, I'll look for ways to, okay, I'll pick this up, put it back in the grass and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's my good deed for the day. But you kind of bring up a good point. You know, a lot of people feel that if there's some amazing salesperson or like you said a ceo of some company that that is just an incredible life path and they've done amazing things and then i've thought before well what is so great about that except for maybe the people that you took care of as a family you know you, you provided for them you gave them nice things you you helped them have a quality life maybe you helped others by offering food or supplies with people that didn't have it you know maybe there was an old lady across the street that couldn't mow the lawn so he went and mow the lawn for her and, and didn't ask for anything just wanted to be nice but in reality what is somebody's position at a corporate job that is basically pushing stuff that isn't real anyway? How does that affect your life path or your overall evolution of spirituality? I don't think it really does. Well, it depends on the person because there definitely can be very powerful people that are also extremely generous or, or extremely loving or, or connected within. What, what happens though is that because, and this can be true of everybody, is that you get so distracted here on the physical plane. You get so pulled in a thousand different directions simultaneously that you're losing that inner connection. So when you're able to, and we all have our lives, we all have our karmas, we all have our families, we all have enormous responsibilities. And what, what Emory is emphasizing is that this, the path of spirituality now is different than what it's been for the last couple thousand years. The last couple thousand years, and this is that Piscean energy, the whole thing was that you withdrew. You went off into a cave, you, you went to a monastery, you focused on your own individual path. And that, that is a path of the old way. We're now into, entering into Aquarian age, so what the path now is something completely different. The path now is that you are truly in the world. You very much have a job, you very much have family, you very much have responsibilities, you're very much interacting with, with many, many people. I mean, just the fact, I mean, communication is just... just skyrocketed in the very recent past with, with the internet and so many you know incredible ways that we can be conscious of what's happening in any place on the planet simultaneously. So so it's a very different world than back when 
1500 years ago or 1800 years ago when you know it took a week to get from one little town to another town so the world's very different and for emory we we are with the times we are moving with the times we're in the 21st century we are part of the world as it is today but also within that incredible activity of the world today we also can be connected within we also can be um as I said before, the light is actually stepping down from these, these upper levels and stepping down. And at the moment, if I understand it all correctly from memory, it's actually in the astral plane itself and stepping into the physical plane. What he says, and this is some of these books I mentioned before, The New Heaven and the New Earth and Planetary Transformation, is that perhaps in our lifetime, we will actually look up in the sky and we will see huge colors or, or angelic beings or, or something very supernatural. And what that means is that the, that light itself is stepping down, it's in the astral plane at the moment, and it's just beginning to step into the physical plane. And we may witness that, that kind of burst into the physical plane of these divine energies. How long have you been meditating? Like if you were to look at how many years, you know, 20 years, 30 years? I could, I could say honestly that um, in high school, I had this, this driving force, and this, this was a while back, it was in the late 60s. Um, the world was, was quite crazy in the late 60s. And, but I had this driving force that there was more out there that I was being taught in high school. Uh, I had a youth minister that, that I would spend all Friday afternoons with, and you know, very um, theology and very intellectual. And, and it was great, but I, but I still knew within that there was something I wasn't being taught. And I had an experience in 19. I, fell off a mountain in Glacier National Park, almost died. And miraculously, I was saved. I should have gone off a cliff and died, but for some reason I crashed, made a 90-degree turn. And, but when I, when I came to consciousness, my whole being was just tingling with this, with this, this incredible gratitude because I knew I hadn't saved myself. I knew something had, had interfered. I, at that moment, I was thanking the sky. I was thanking the earth. I was thanking the, the ice itself, thanking something that had saved me because I knew I hadn't done it myself. So, and those are the, for me, I was struggling to understand. And I had many teachers and I would usually last for maybe two years or so and then I'd always reach the end of their knowledge field. And then I was 34, I met Emery and it was the first time in my life that I actually had met someone that I knew very, very quickly that there was no end to his knowledge field, that there was this unlimited possibility of understanding. And that was 30 years ago. And I'm still just scratching the surface of, of what Emory's about or what the, the, his, his teaching is all about, what his understanding is all about, and what the, the purpose here on the planet and the crisis on the planet and what we have to do to, to help Earth out of this crisis. It sounds to me like Emory's a real guru, almost. Guru is not a very popular term in the West. It has a lot of um, negative connotations, which is just the West kind of misunderstanding it. Uh, I'm not using East, it that way at all. I mean, I, I definitely but, think if somebody called me a guru, I'd be like, well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, yeah, that's no, an absolute honor to be called that. But yeah, you're right. I guess the Western civilization doesn't look at it the way they should. What I like to refer to Emory as just, is just a really powerful spiritual teacher. And there were there, there's always been Every so often, there, there comes along really beautiful teachers. And I feel very, very fortunate that I've met Emery in 1986 when I first met him. And as I said before, I was, I was on a retreat up in Canada. I was just sitting in front of him. And all of a sudden, I could feel all these changes in my aura, all kinds of things that I'd never experienced before. It was just things were just changing and switching. And, and so I, I knew very quickly that I was in the presence of, of someone who, had, who could really help me. And it, as I said, that was 30 years ago, and I'm still have a long way to go. Um, I'm not always the best meditator. Uh, I mean, I do my best, but I get just distracted in the world like everybody else. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Absolutely. And maybe just a couple more questions before we close out tonight, and certainly appreciate you coming on here at The Leak Project. I read a book several years ago, and... It's the kind of book that you could read on a daily basis to really practice the exercises. It's called Initiation of Hermetics by Franz Barden. And, and Franz passed away, I think, in the 60s. And he was really, for his time, or for any time, way ahead 
and beyond mentally. And hermetics, for those that don't know what hermetics actually is, at least in this book, it's referred to as like mental exercises. And one of his biggest, I guess, one of the most important things that he discusses in order to practice hermetics is learn how to clear the mind, meditation, such as what's talked about in the way of the spiritual warrior. And if you can get to actually being able to clear the mind, if you can do that for long periods of time, then you get into other applications on how to project your thoughts into, it may, like let's say there's an, a, a bird flying around and, and you can literally get in tune with that bird's consciousness and see what it is seeing, feel what it is feeling. Have you ever been able to do anything like that? Has Emery, does he talk about stuff like that or is that kind of a different path? Well, that's, no, Emery actually, what Emery talks about and, and a lot of times what you have to be clear about is that uh, different teachers have a different language and what that means is that they, they understand a reality, but they have to put that reality into a particular language in a particular context. So for Emery, what he talks about, of course, focusing on the mind and clearing the mind, but what Emery talks about is consciousness. And what that means is that we, we have a consciousness before we're born. After we die, we still have this consciousness. And so what he teaches is, is how to connect to this consciousness. and. What that means is that what you, the way we really are meant to be on this planet, not like we are today, because everyone is kind of stuck in a, we only experience a fraction of, of who we truly are. But what we are meant to be is really incredibly expanded consciousness, meaning that you can walk into a forest and you feel the whole forest simultaneously. You, you can experience, you may see a cloud thousands of feet in front of in, ahead of you, on top of you, but, but your consciousness is so expanded, you actually experience the cloud itself. You experience a bird flies by and you experience the energy of the bird itself. It's like your, your whole experience of this plane is very different than looking at through your physical eyes or looking at you know, mentally how you're, you're reacting or, or commenting about what's happening in front of you, but that your consciousness is very expanded. And the, I remember I live in San Francisco and I would go to the... Um, Golden Gate Park. And I remember this was a few years back and I was walking every morning. I had to do this as a meditation, just sort of walk through the, the park and experience the park. I remember there was a certain moment, it's all of a sudden I, be, I could feel myself at the, I can't say it myself, but I could feel like the top of the tree. It was like my consciousness had expanded and I was experiencing the tree itself. And I was so, I was, well, I started crying. I was just so, so overwhelmed by that experience. So what it, what it taught me was that I was able to, to expand my awareness of, of what is present. And that is, that's very much what Emery is teaching. That's very much what a warrior is. A true spiritual warrior is very conscious of many things simultaneously. That's pretty neat how you put that. Instead of just focusing on that one part of consciousness, you're kind of enveloping the whole thing. You know, you're looking at everything, the clouds, the, the stars, the atmosphere, and bringing that all into the consciousness. So if you look at the whole quantum physics theory again, once again, we'll get into the science part of this. That makes sense. You just have to understand how to change or transfer your sense of vision to another location in this quantum suit makeup of the matrix that we all live in. It's incredible. And, and I certainly appreciate the information you brought to the table with us, William. Now, is there anything that I might have missed or that you'd like to share with our listeners here at The Leak Project before we close out tonight? And before you do, I would strongly recommend our listeners go to soundinglight.com if you'd like to have access to The Way of the Spiritual Warrior. There's also a whole bunch of other books on similar topics as well as different genres on there. So I'd recommend checking that out, soundinglight.com one little thing and that is I know the the world's going crazy I know just turning on the news in the evening can for some people is overwhelming and it's too much for them and what that is how it's meant to be that's the moment that we are experiencing and it it will increase it's not going to diminish for many reasons these energies are there's enormous energies coming to the planet so there's enormous uh, change happening in the planet and if you're able to to know that that's part of the process, that there's also a good side to that, and that good side or that beautiful side is that the light itself is really in here into the physical plane and can really burst into your life and really help you see clearly, help you really become conscious within, help you really understand the next step in, in your development. And that first step, however small it could be, can be incredibly powerful and can really help the planet down the road. 
Right on. I really appreciate you coming on here with us, William. Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to speak with you again sometime. You have a fantastic day. Folks, I would recommend going to leakproject.com. If you become a contributing member on Leak Project, you'll get access to exclusive content. Sometimes we have three or four shows updated daily. Also, if you just want to get access to the podcast, if you go to youtube.com slash clandestine time lord, you'll have access to the latest podcast. Absolutely free. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and be the change you want to see. This is Rex Bear. Talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Baer, and we have guest William Von Holst with us. Now, we're going to be discussing the way of the spiritual warrior, timeless path to enlightenment. This is by Emery Vallion, and let me just give you a quick excerpt of the book. This is a very special book, a must-have resource full of inspiration and techniques for all those aspiring to be true spiritual warriors. The art of the warrior is to be enlightened every second of every day. It is not something you look forward to in the future. It is something you live now. The warrior path is always in the immediate moment at this second of time in your total relationship with the outer world and the world inside you. With the divine presence within you and the divine presence outside you, the way of the spiritual warrior starts with self-knowledge, learning to harmonize your personality. The next stage is using meditation and other spiritual techniques to draw your awareness slowly inside you until you make a connection with yourself as a living soul and recognize that you are an immortal spiritual being. All right, this is great. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. How the heck are you, William? I'm doing great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to have you on the show. Now, please tell us about the book and what is the path of a spiritual warrior? What this book is focusing on is that everyone on the spiritual path has struggles. Everyone has challenges with the world. Everyone has challenges within. And so what Emory focuses on, he's always very, very practical. For him, spirituality is not something nebulous, something of faith, something that is kind of airy-fairy. For what for Emory, spirituality is a science. And I mean that in a very good sense, because what that means is that if you do certain things, if you understand certain things, you will have certain results. So Emory is always very specific and very practical. So what he says is that we who live on this planet, who live in this school of hard knocks, it's a tough place to be, it's a tough place to incarnate. As we all know, what's happening in the world, what's happening in America, things are getting, getting tougher, things are getting more crazy. So what Emory is focusing on is that, yes, the outside world is going crazy, but we don't need to be impacted by that craziness. What we can do is that we can become truly connected within. And when you're truly connected within, then, as he says, what you become is that spiritual warrior. So you become a focus of light. You become a focus of stability. You become a focus of, of calmness. So in all this chaotic world that we're all experiencing, and, and many people are getting hit either emotionally or getting hit mentally or getting hit physically by all different kinds of predicaments. What Emory is teaching is that for more and more people to be really clear within, to be really, really connected with their inner soul or connected to the light itself or connected to their true being within, that they become of service, they can help many, many other people and they become like, as Emory said, you know, Christ was a spiritual warrior, the Buddha was a spiritual warrior, Kuan Yin was a spiritual warrior. Oddly enough, the, the mother of Christ, the Virgin Mary herself, was, was a very powerful spiritual warrior. So these are um, examples of, of these very powerful spiritual leaders in the past who have been a, a, a beacon of light or a beacon of hope or a beacon of light that has helped certain civilizations through certain crises. Now, what is a way to actually get to that stability and be able to be, I guess you could say, like water? What, what I'm, and this is right. I've been working with Emory for 30 years, so I, I've, I'm working exclusively with Emory, so I, I really understand what, the process that he teaches. And, and in the very first few chapters, what he talks about is that we as a personality, and he uses this metaphor, we're like a vehicle, and we have four wheels. And we, the four wheels are the physical body, which we all know. We all have an etheric body, which is our vitality body, kind of the body that gives us life and, and energy. 
some people, like an athlete, has a very, very strong vital, um, vital body or etheric body. Um, someone who is sick or, or struggling has a very weak etheric body. So that's another wheel on this vehicle. And there's two other wheels on this vehicle. There's the emotional body, uh, your feminine, astral, all your emotions. Every time you dream, you're in your emotional body. And then there's also a mental body, and that's another wheel. So what he, what he suggests in the beginning on the path is that you really become balanced so that all of your four wheels are on the earth, are driving, are, you know, if you have a car, you know what it means to have your axles and everything all balanced. So what he says is the first step is that you balance or that you have a well-balanced four wheels on your vehicle. And for a lot of people, that's not the case. For a lot of people, they may be too emotional. They may be too mental. They may be too focused on the physical plane, on their body. So they're not driving with those four tires on the road. They're kind of driving with perhaps two tires on the road and two tires up in the air. So they're, it's hard to them for that vehicle to actually drive on the road. And the other part of this whole metaphor is that the true driver of a well-balanced vehicle is your soul itself. So when your four wheels are balanced, then your soul can actually grab that steering wheel and then drive that vehicle of the personality. And the soul then has this vision of where it wants to drive and not be so much the the victim of, of a, a personality out of control trying to drive this vehicle every which way with four tires not on the road, maybe one or two or whatever tires connecting the road and other tires up in the air. So this metaphor of a vehicle, four wheels firmly on the earth, and then the soul is able to drive and be well grounded. And that's really the, the first step of the spiritual warrior. That's incredible. It almost reminds me of the old shamans how they would create balance with the mind, body, and soul. They had different wills that they used, etc. And meditation is so powerful. It can be such a great cornerstone if you can actually learn to silent the, silence the mind for a period of time. For more than 10 seconds, I would recommend anybody listening to this broadcast try to actually silence your mind for 10 seconds and think about absolutely nothing. It's, it's a lot tougher than it sounds if you've never tried it before. So does he teach are some different techniques uh, taught within this book, William? There there's, um, there's many, many techniques. And to go back to what you just said, the, the silencing of the mind is, is, well, it's actually the silencing of the mental body. I was also silencing the emotional body. Because you can, you can sit down and try to be quiet. Your mind might be still, but your emotions can, get, can pour in. You get anxious, or you, you have an itch, or you're worried about paying your taxes tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's I mean, the whole, the spiritual path is learning how to be in control of your, your bodies. And silencing the mind is a tough one. It's a real, I mean, people for thousands of years struggle how to silence the mind. And it's challenging just to sit down to try to silence it because it's, it's the mind trying to silence itself, which is very challenging. But Emery says, if you want something to happen, you have to bring in a higher energy and let that higher energy or that higher technique or higher process silence the mind. Because if you si try to silence the mind with your own mind, it's like, you're just struggling, you know, rock, you know, rock in a hard place is one way of saying it. So in this book, he gives many techniques. He gives two breathing techniques. He also gives some techniques of uh, intoning mantras. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's also um, in techniques of intoning vowels. So what this means is that you do a, a technique and your mind focuses on that technique, focuses on the breath meditation, focuses on a mantra, focuses on a task. Is that we who live on this planet, who live in this school of hard knocks, it's a tough place to be, it's a tough place to incarnate. As we all know what's happening in the world, what's happening in America, things are getting, getting tougher, things are getting more crazy. So what Emory is focusing on is that, yes, the outside world is going crazy, but we don't need to be impacted by that craziness. What we can do is that we can become truly connected within. And when you're truly connected within, then, as he says, what you become is that spiritual warrior. So you become a focus of light. You become a focus of stability. You become a focus of, of calmness. So in all this chaotic world that we're all experiencing, and, and many people are getting hit either emotionally or getting hit mentally or getting hit physically by all different kinds of predicaments, what Emory is teaching is that for more and more people to be really clear within, to be really 
really connected with their inner soul, they're connected to the light itself, or connected to their true being within, that they become of service, they can help many, many other people, and they become like, as Emery said, you know, Christ was a spiritual warrior, the Buddha was a spiritual warrior, Kuan Yin was a spiritual warrior. Oddly enough, the, the mother of Christ, the Virgin Mary herself, was, was a very powerful spiritual warrior. So these are um, examples of, of these very powerful spiritual leaders in the past who have been a, a, a beacon of light or a beacon of hope or a beacon of light that has helped certain civilizations through certain crises. Now, what is a way to actually get to that stability and be able to be, I guess you could say, like water? What, what I'm, and this is right. I've been working with Emory for 30 years, so I, I, I'm working exclusively with Emory, so I, I really understand what the process that he teaches. And, and in the very first few chapters, what he talks about is that we as a personality, and he uses this metaphor, we're like a vehicle, and we have four wheels. And we, the four wheels are the physical body, which we all know. We all have an etheric body, which is our vitality body, kind of the body that gives us life and, and energy. Some people, like an athlete, has a very, very strong vital, um, vital body or etheric body. Um, someone who is sick or, or struggling has a very weak etheric body. So that's another wheel on this vehicle. And there's two other wheels on this vehicle. There's the emotional body, uh, your feminine, astral, all your emotions. Every time you dream, you're in your emotional body. And then there's also a mental body, and that's another wheel. So what he, what he suggests in the beginning on the path is that you really become balanced so that all of your four wheels are on the earth, are driving, are, you know, if you have a car, you know what it means to have your axles and everything all balanced. So what he says is the first step is that you balance or that you have a well-balanced four wheels on your vehicle. And for a lot of people, that's not the case. For a lot of people, they may be too emotional, they may be too mental, they may be too focused on the physical plane, on their body. So they're not driving with those four tires on the road. They're kind of driving with perhaps two tires on the road and two tires up in the air. So it's hard to them for that vehicle to actually drive on the road. And the other part of this whole metaphor is that the true driver of a well-balanced vehicle is your soul itself. So when your four wheels are balanced, then your soul can actually grab that steering wheel and then drive that vehicle of the personality. And the soul then has this vision of where it wants to drive and not be so much the, the victim of, of a, a personality out of control trying to drive this vehicle every which way with four tires not on the road, maybe one or two or whatever, tires connecting the road and other tires up in the air. So this metaphor of a vehicle, four wheels firmly on the earth, and then the soul is able to drive and be well. Meditation focuses on a mantra focuses on a task. So what that does is it keeps the mind busy. It's like the analogy is we all have kind of a monkey mind. The, the monkey loves to jump from branch to branch to branch. So you, if you try to still that monkey, it's really hard. But if you keep the monkey busy, meaning that the monkey, the mind, is focusing on breathing in, breathing out with particular words or mantras, then the monkey's kind of happy. It doesn't jump all over the place. And then when the monkey kind of gets focused on the task, then what happens is that there's another quality that, that is allowed to manifest and your mind actually becomes quiet or your emotions actually become, become quiet. So it's an it's a interesting way of, of, and a very practical way of dealing with the challenges of what it's like to be human, be on this planet in the 21st century, to be affected by all these crazy energies that are going on everywhere. And as Emery said, these crazy energies are only going to increase because of many, many different factors. So we need help. We need ways to to deal with all this chaos absolutely now are there certain foods and like times of day that he recommends eating does does he recommend staying away from different meats and stuff like that as well or well this is a personal note but he, he grew up in hungary during world war ii in budapest and uh quite poor and this is a little side story but i was living with him down in san diego and uh, we we're making bacon in the morning and, you know, for me, I, you know, the bacon grease is all kind of put in a jar and just forgotten about and thrown away someday. He was very adamant that I don't throw out the bacon grease. So, of course, I didn't. It stayed in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Then for lunch, a few weeks later, he takes out this jar of bacon grease, takes a huge knife, slaps it all over a piece of bread, puts paprika on it, and tells me this is what he grew up with. And he called it a fat sandwich. So... 
for Emery, I know lots of people focus on all kinds of diets and has something to do with spirituality. For Emery, that's... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Baer, and we have guest William Von Holst with us. Now, we're going to be discussing the way of the spiritual warrior, timeless path time to enlightenment. This is by Emery Vallion, and let me just give you a quick excerpt of the book. This is a very special book, a must-have resource full of inspiration and techniques for all those aspiring to be true spiritual warriors. The art of the warrior is to be enlightened every second of every day. It is not something you look forward to in the future. It is something you live now. The warrior path is always in the immediate moment at this second of time in your total relationship with the outer world and the world inside you. With the divine presence within you and the divine presence outside you, the way of the spiritual warrior starts with self-knowledge, learning to harmonize your personality. The next stage is using meditation and other spiritual techniques to withdraw your awareness slowly inside you until you make a connection with yourself as a living soul and recognize that you are an immortal spiritual being. All right, this is great. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. How the heck are you, William? I'm doing great. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. I'm glad to have you on the show. Now, please tell us about the book and what is the path of a spiritual warrior. What this book is focusing on is that everyone on the spiritual path has struggles. Everyone has challenges with the world. Everyone has challenges within. And so what Emery focused on, he's always very, very practical. For him, spirituality is not something nebulous, something of faith, something that is kind of airy fairy. For what for Emory, spirituality is a science, and I mean that in a very good sense, because what that means is that if you do certain things, if you understand certain things, you will have certain results. So Emory is always very specific and very practical. So what he says is all grounded, and that's really the, the first step of a spiritual warrior. That's incredible. It almost reminds me of the old shamans how they would create balance with the mind, body, and soul. They had different wills that they used, etc. And meditation is so powerful. It can be such a great cornerstone if you can actually learn to silence the mind for a period of time. For more than 10 seconds, I would recommend anybody listening to this broadcast try to actually silence your mind for 10 seconds and think about absolutely nothing. It's, it's a lot tougher than it sounds if you've never tried it before. So does he teach are some different techniques uh, taught within this book, William? There's, um, there's many, many techniques. And to go back to what you just said, the, the silencing of the mind is, is, well, it's actually the silencing of the mental body. I was also silencing the emotional body. Because you can, you can sit down and try to be quiet. Your mind might be still, but your emotions can, get, can pour in. You get anxious or you, you have an itch or you're worried about paying your taxes tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's I mean, the whole, the spiritual path is learning how to be in control of your, your bodies. And silencing the mind is a tough one. It's a real, I mean, people for thousands of years struggle how to silence the mind. And it's challenging just to sit down to try to silence it because it's, it's the mind trying to silence itself, which is very challenging. What Emery says, if you want something to happen, you have to bring in a higher energy and let that higher energy or that higher technique or higher process silence the mind. Because if you si try to silence the mind with your own mind, it's like, you're just struggling, you know, rock, you know, rock in a hard place is one way of saying it. So in this book, he gives many techniques. He gives two breathing techniques. He also gives some techniques of uh, intoning mantras. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's also um, in techniques of intoning vowels. So what this means is that you do a, a technique and your mind focuses on that technique, focuses on the breath.